I want to start off by just asking you how you got involved with Jingle Jangle, which is such a fun title to say. Oh, yeah, it is. Um, well, the director, David Talbert, he, he asked me to sit with him and talk to him about it. And he told me the story of it. And uh, I was really taken by what he was trying to do and what he was, the scope of what he was trying to create. So uh, I signed on. Tell me a little bit more about like what his pitch was, just because I feel like it's not necessarily the easiest thing to explain right away. He told me that I was going to be playing Jeronicus Jangle. It was like sort of a classic figure, like a uh, Dr. Doolittle or a Willy Wonka or a, what did you say? Uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, those kinds of those kinds of characters. Um, oh, uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Pots, and uh, that they would take the, that he was going to be going on a journey where he was going to meet. He was going to lose everything that his apprentice would steal all of his stuff and he was going to go on a journey where he, his granddaughter would come into his life and make him begin to relieve in life again, believe in magic again, and reconcile the family and come together. And that was, that was really, a, I thought, an amazing theme to be able to work from and a great character to play. And he said it was going to be a musical. And I was going to, <laughs> and I was going to be singing. And uh, that was exciting to me. That felt like a real stretch and like a, it was going to be a challenge too. And so, uh, so I signed on, and, and I knew he was trying to make something that was multicultural, that was gonna like, uh, like was be my family, so it was gonna be a black family, but it was gonna be a universal theme that everyone could feel and love. And um, here I am. Yeah, of course. I mean, doing a musical like that, you know, you, you're of course a trained professional, a trained singer uh, in your education. Uh, you know, what was the difference from leaping from that to this? It was a big difference. I mean, um, see, I'd done a couple of musicals in high school. Um, Jesus Christ Superstar and Cabaret. Those are the two I did. And, um, and then I did a light opera called The Beggar's Opera. And that's kind of all that I'd done. And then I was studying in conservatory. So I just let it be behind and just started acting and studying acting and working on my craft. And... Uh, so it was like a really big deal to like try to play a character that was centered, that would be able to break into song and you would believe it. And you say, okay, this, this is a real reality. So that was, that's a special thing. You know, you know it, was, it was a big challenge for me at first. I was, I was really nervous. Just because of that, the commitment you need to have to really sell that moment? I mean, I, I think it's already acceptable like on stage that somebody can break out into song when they like are in the middle of an argument. But in film, it's not as deep of a part of our film language, although we've seen a lot of musicals come out now, you know? But this is like an original one. Most of them are not, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so it was trying to, you don't know what to expect, whatever. And I thought that was a, he's, he's, a, he's a, you know, Dronicus is a damaged character, you know? Uh, he's had a lot of loss. And to be able to balance that and still be in a joyous environment in the film, was like another challenge to do to to do so it was it was all yeah it was it was all a special kind of challenge do you remember what roles you played in the musicals you did in high school um i played simon zealtes in uh jesus christ superstar yeah. Christ, i love you did you see i wait i remember that song i believe in you and god so tell me that i'm saying dun, 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 dun. um and uh and then <laughs> um, I did this, I sang the solo of the German youth in Cabaret. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, it's a high school production. And I think they were looking for somebody who could sing high enough to do it. At the time I was a first tenor. It was most just singing the song to carry the story forward. It was <laughs> that is quite a song to sing for anyone, I suppose. You know, in the telling of the tale of, you know, of the occupation and of like the, it was, uh, it was, it was more used as a representation of like uh, of uh, that side, mm. and it was just a question of who could sing the song. Right, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, in in looking at your career, like you know, doing something like uh, Jingle Jangle, like feels like feels like such a really fun choice, just because it's something you can share with families. You know, is that is that the factor in you know when you, what you, what kind of roles you decide to take on? I guess I want to do roles that like are full of hope and joy too, you know, and I mean, I think I'm at a time and I want to try to do things like that. Um, I want to do more films for my kids, you know, but they're grown now, 
you know? Um, although I think a movie like Jingle Jangle would really appeal to them, uh, just like uh, Panther appealed to them. Um, so I don't know, I'll, I'll continue to do that. It'll, it's not gonna be just one particular genre I'm gonna do because the thing I do is I like try to learn every time I do a new part. So I'm trying to stretch myself as a person. And so it won't be like I'll be doing all these movies that are exactly like this. That's my lane. Nah. <laughs> I mean, I think looking at your resume, that, that stands out a lot. Like, it just seems like you take things you're really passionate about, no matter what the genre is. Hmm. I do. I mean, the one I have after this one was, was special. Um, respect, uh, which is about uh, Aretha Franklin, and I play her father, C.L. Franklin. And, and that character is, is so far removed from Jeronicus Jangle, it's like night and day. I mean, he's a you know, sort of authoritarian, you know, civil rights activist, preacher who like forces his daughter to like sing and tries to get her, nurtures her through uh, to become a star their breakup so it's quite different they're all I don't know what the one after that will be I don't <laughs> next thing I do is go back and do Godfather Harlem I play Bumpy Johnson he's a he's a gangster he's a you know mobster right you know congratulations on a second season for that thanks uh, I mean that that, you know, that that show had such an incredible cast so I'm really glad that it's we get it coming back together thanks um in terms of uh you know in terms of you know just back in the days when you could walk down the street without a face mask on. Uh, I'm very curious, you know, when people would spot you, what would they tend to recognize you from? Oh, it's really weird. Like, uh, people recognize me from all different kinds of films, you know, like there's like a group of people, like if I was in New York, they would recognize me for doing Ghost Talk, you know, uh, which is an indie movie. Then um, uh, a bunch of people would recognize me from, Goff um, from um, the butler and then other ones would do it for the last king of scotland it's not really and it's like it's, it's, it's a unique thing because it's like young people to really old people like they have all different choices and stuff in between but i can't say that there's just one movie in particular like they'll come up and say something like i saw you in smoke and I'm like smoke you know it's, it's like a long time ago <laughs> you were great in the crying game i was like okay, thanks you know <laughs> it's really nice it's really nice to have a fan base that's like allows you to like reach so many different types of uh, people, mostly probably because I, I do very different types of films, you know? I mean, the legacy of Ghost Dog, I feel like is an interesting one to bring up just because that feels like it's, it was an indie film that really, you know, got a lot of attention as, through your performance especially. Yeah, uh, I mean, I loved working with uh, Jim on, the, on Ghost Dog. It was a really interesting character. He wrote that character for me um, and it has its own audience. It's like a cult audience that follows it, you know. Um, I've done. I started in indie films. I think before they even called them that. When I did the Crying Game, people weren't saying they called it an indie film. But now uh, I don't even know if if, if, the, if it's going to change now too, because now we're in a different time where streaming is so present that I don't know if you would call them indie films anymore. It's hard to know where the line is. Um, <laughs> In your head, is there a film that you, a film or any any project, TV included, that you feel like was the first role where you felt like, okay, I've got, I, I feel like I know, I feel like I'm an actor now. I feel like I, I'm, I'm making this work. It would be Last King of Scotland. Um, that's really late in my career, but I kept striving for that, um, to be able to disappear inside of a character and uh, for you just to see that character, hopefully, not me. Um, I, I, I look back on the other films and stuff and like now with time I've been able to see like there were some qualities that I'm like, I appreciate, you know, but that was one where I felt that I'd done everything that I could to play the part. And there was nothing else more for me to do. What is the reality of having an Oscar? How, how has that changed your life and your career? I think there's uh, some respect around it, you know. Um, uh, the thing was that uh, before I got the Oscar, I was playing really diverse characters. I was like playing Charlie Parker Bird and like in Crying Game and Smoke and all these different films with different types of characters. And after, I still continued to play all these different kinds of characters in different kinds of films with different... Uh, so I can't say it was... Uh, it wasn't a negative, it was a positive, but 
I continued to, to follow the, pretty much the path that I had taken all along. Uh, Geronica's Jangle is completely different than uh, uh, C.L. Franklin, you know? Of course. And, you know, it's, you know it's, I mean, it's very different from Edie and Mean as well. Yeah. Um, in, terms of, in terms of Jingle Jangle, uh, what, you know, what was it like working you know, so much, so much with the young actress whose name I'm blinking on right now? I'm so sorry. Uh, Madeline Mills. Yes, she was lovely, and it, it's, it seems like you guys got to have a real chance to develop a dynamic together. I, uh, I think she's amazing. I think she's, it's rare that you meet a new talent like a young talent like that, and you can see that they're destined to be able to be doing this forever, and they'll like make a mark on cinema in some way. I felt like she was it, that kind of a artist, that she was going to be that way. She has that special quality. And you can work with her in the scenes, and it's really centered and focused to try to do something really great. And then she is authentic enough to go off and be a kid and play and, and still come back and with seriousness, add something new to the scene. So I think she's uh, really special. So something I, I do want to ask you about is, uh, is Star Wars, but in kind of, just kind of, again, asking you a question that I will never probably know the answer to, which is what is it like to be asked to join the Star Wars universe? <laughs> I don't know. It was, uh, it was exciting. <laughs> uh, when they talked to me about doing it, I was like, are you serious? Star Wars? You know? Um, and then when I did it and I actually went there to do it, it was like being involved in some sort of pre-existing universe that was, that was there and that you like became a part of. And I, uh, and I really enjoyed um, getting a chance to do it, actually. I'm a, I'm a sci-fi fan too, mm. so it was even doubly that, you know. And I remember in high school, I think it was in high school, when Star Wars first came out, the first ones, and uh, I remember going to see it and being like amazed at what was going on. I was with uh, Harrison and Chewbacca, and <laughs> it's great. Yeah. When you got brought in, like, how much discussion was there around like developing your character? You know, what would Saw Gerrera look like? You know, what would what would his what would his voice sound like? There's stuff that we go and reshoot or shoot again and stuff. And there was discussions about like his hair and how that was going to be and whether he was going to be like uh, the earlier warrior you saw with shortcut or like the long kind of crazed, like frizzled, gray, sandy, you know, character that he became. So I was involved in, this, in that discussion with them. But uh, they're very clear on the, very clear on the dialogue already and everything's like the character. And there's lore around Sagarera. Sagarera exists in Star Wars lore, and he's followed by people. He had already been on an animated TV series. I've actually done him as an animated character as well. And um, so he has a lore that has to be followed, too. All right. What is it like knowing that the character lives on beyond, like, your on-screen portrayal? I think, it's, I think it's kind of fun, you know? It's fun to be watching, see what he's going to become. I mean... Uh, and also, like, when they go into different multiverses, whether or not you're still involved in this universe over here, whether on this universe over here. So I think uh, I'll be continuing to do stuff inside of their universes. Would you feel different if they had, if, 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 if they had decided that they didn't want to ask you back as Saw? Um, I mean, I think I would be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I still would, like, uh, probably enjoy the film, because on who it was, you know? Uh, but I, you know, I was fortunate I mean, that they wanted me to do that and, you know, they've asked me, I've done it as an animated character, I've done it as, on the film, I've done it as a, I've done it three ways, I can't remember the third way. Video games maybe? Oh, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a game. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Are, you, are you a much of a gamer? Um, not really. I like, I like, I like, I like to play somewhat, but I'm not a gamer. I mean, gamers like or on the couch, like going for it, like sometimes days it in, but it's not me. You enjoy games casually. I do casually, I guess, but I can't. I can't. It's been a while since I've actually played something, so um, I guess I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to go and play like games in the in the mall and stuff all the time. But we're talking about serious serious games that are. I'm not. I'm not a gamer. <laughs> Although I am in a game. <laughs>
No, I mean, it's, yeah, I think there's a weird, there's a weird like barrier to entry with it sometimes where you feel like, you know, if you don't play like three hours a day. How, can, how dare you call yourself a gamer? Yeah. You know, one thing that I feel like I, I find fascinating about your career is the fact that you've also directed, you know, some great films that I've really enjoyed, uh, it, you know, it, but they've always felt like unconventional choices. And I'm curious, like, you know, when you, when you sat down with those scripts, what was it that made you want to direct them? Well, when I first got sent the first movie I did, which was for HBO called Strapped, it was a movie about the, the uh, cop and his relationship with these kids with guns. And um, I asked him if I could like change it to be about the kids and then and, and not about the police officer. And that was kind of like an interesting journey into that. I think uh, when I worked with um, Terry McMillan on Waiting to Exhale, uh, it was about a journey of healing that I was working on with her. and creating the, the script with her and Ron Bass. And there's something that's a thematic that I think carried through on the films that followed, which is about personal healing. And in this case, it was about these women trying to heal from their bad relationships and the loves in their life. And I think the same thing happened in, in uh, Hope Floats with Sandy Bullock and the character who had just been divorced and, and, and humiliated, which had to try to find her life again and find herself again and love again. Um, and that kind of too, uh, was a, it, that was interesting to me, trying to figure out about healing. And so I did those films. Do you feel like there's a particular reason why that subject matter meant a lot to you at that time? I was trying to understand about uh, healing from relationships and stuff. And, and, and um, I, when I read the book, I could see different characters that I knew from when I read Waiting to Exhale. And... Um, I wanted to put their stories on, on film, stories of my aunts and, you know, grandparents and friends and people that I knew and my mom. And so I tried, to, I tried to infuse the script with those kinds of truths. And the same thing for, for Whole Floats was about healing. And then maybe even um, First Daughter was in some ways about someone finding their own voice. And like this, a lot of the healing that happened inside of those films was about finding your own voice and finding your own way and, and embracing your own power. That was, that was interesting to me. Is directing something you want to go back to at some point? Yeah, I think so. I, I just, it just takes a long time, you know, it takes a number of years. Usually every time I did it, it took me at least a few years to do. Um, I, think, I think in a few years though, I've been, I've been starting to think more about directing again. And so I just have to find the right thing or the right story and then I'll do it. I have another jingle jangle question. If I'm not mistaken, the production was shot uh, with you guys singing to playback. A lot of it was singing to playback. Uh, although I am one of, like as David says, one of the few who gets to have the distinction of having to sing live. Oh, really? So I sang um, the song over and over when they leave over and over and over again. I think of my life and what it might have been. Um, we started out shooting that um, so we were going to cut, but uh, he kept going. And so I kept, I started singing the song and I sang it through and, and the crew was really supportive of me actually. After it was done, they, they gave me like a, a, a bunch of claps and stuff. And that was nice. That was very encouraging of them. I mean, is it, because it feels like one of the trickiest magic tricks a musical has to pull off is feeling like this very alive, spontaneous thing on screen. Well, at the same time, like everything's really carefully coordinated. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like when you have like major dance numbers and stuff that are dependent on certain things like that, like make it work, which is pre-record, uh, uh, you, you kind of have to have to do certain things to make sure that everything's on, on the same steps with the cameras and stuff like that. But there's a couple of times where like that one and then I think actually the one where I, with my daughter, I just sing a line to her uh, when she comes back to me and I ask her to forgive me and then I, and then I, I sing a small little thing to her uh, about my love and stuff. And so, but, but mostly everything else was, re was pre-recorded. Is doing more musical or musical, music adjacent uh, stuff is something you also see wanting to do in the future? If, um, if there's a part that's great, I would love to do it. I, loved, I had a good time. I, I think part of it's because uh, I love the joy and stuff that the director has about making film. And, how much the story meant to him, and it was so emotional an experience for me that it left uh, it lifted my spirits. Honestly, I was I had been trying to re, re 
revamp my verb about work and to like have a passion towards it, you know, and uh, and this kind of did that for me. And it, it was it, it ignited something in me that was really great. It's a very nice, wholesome experience. I did I I, I, I watched it. I worked on a jigsaw puzzle. It felt great. Um, but I feel like I mean, it, but that speaks to what you're saying, which is the idea that this is you know, there's just something really nice about creating something nice like this. Hmm. Yeah, there is. It's an amazing feeling, actually. When you're doing something that like ultimately deals with people overcoming their fears and pains and finding life and joy, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like a, it's a great thing. And, 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 and because my character is going through that journey, I'm going through it too as a person in a little bit alongside him. So it's kind of nice to come out on the other end of it and find a little joy, you know? Are there discussions about like calibrating the performance, making sure you weren't like going full Scrooge at the beginning? Uh, <laughs> Don't go full Scrooge. <laughs> go full Scrooge. <laughs> yeah, no, I was trying to figure out how to balance on that. And because I was trying to look at, like, when you look at some of the older classics and stuff, too, like the um, the actors, like, were usually going through something sad and painful in some way. And But there was, but you still, like, uh, enjoy taking the journey with them. <laughs> they lost something. They were losing their house. They were, uh, lost their family. And I think there was... A universe, I, was, I mean, a place I was trying to let him stand on that allowed you to feel the loss that he had, but to also be, be excited about taking a journey with him. And that's what I was trying to find, that balance of... I don't know if I looked at it as a balance of that. It was just a person that who is like that. That's a really good point about Christmas movies. Like, you know, George Bailey in It's Wonderful Life is going through some rough stuff and is kind of a jerk to people. But, you know, it's Jimmy Stewart, so you love him. Yeah, yeah. It's like then I think on most of them there's something tragic underneath. I mean, I think the holiday seasons can be tragic for a lot of people anyway. The these stories are usually are about people reclaiming things and restoring themselves and starting to find again their ability to have a life, a home, a family, a friendship, a belief in themselves. Definitely the time of year I cry the most, but mostly because of holiday movies. They always get me. <laughs> Did this one get this one get you? Actually, yeah, yeah. I got I got really choked up. Um, I mean, maybe it was just because I was watching people singing and dancing together in a public place that it felt really nice and oh. far away. But you know, oh god, I'm getting a little teary actually right now. But that's 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 the power of Christmas movies. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, actually, let me let me. Uh, I, I'm running a little low on time with you, but I'm kind of curious. Uh, do you have any personal Christmas favorites? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a old claymation one called Santa Claus is Coming to Town that uh, Bedester did and like has that song in it. Put one foot in front of the other, you know, from the, you know, there's there's a great scene in that where where they're being chased by the sorcerer all the time, the icy sorcerer, and then uh, he gives him he says when they capture him, Santa you know Santa Claus, uh, Chris Kringle, he says I have something for you. He pulls out this this uh, choo choo train, and the guy like. Holds it and he says, a choo-choo? I've always wanted a choo-choo. <laughs> and, and his icy melt heart melts. <laughs> yeah, so that story, and, and it, it kind of like illuminated like how, how Kris Kringle or Santa Claus like learned how to do everything, how his reindeer like actually learned how to fly. I think also like maybe uh, just you know, the, the Grinch was something I always looked forward to almost every year. Yeah. You know, um, it was one of those great classic holidays. And then you see his heart grow, you know, once he, like, actually cares. I remember, like, his dog that he had, like, with the reindeer antlers and stuff, you know. Yeah. Those are classic movies for Christmas time. Oh, absolutely. Um, so to wrap things up, you know, looking forward, you know, what are you excited about right now? Like, you know, what are you, you know, you, 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 beyond work, Perhaps even just what, what in your life is making you happy right now? Happy and content is, is hard. I mean, I mean, I, I think just to continue to try to connect with my family and stuff. And during this time, I mean, I think it's a uh, still a difficult time, uh, the pandemic and all the social and racial unrest and stuff that's going on in the in the country and around the world. Um, so trying to like look at the simple things, mm -hmm. the little things. 
you know, making sure I connect with my kids and stuff and uh, trying to um, enjoy like the little moments that we have, good food, good things, uh, uh, we're connecting with friends. Um, and as far as like uh, work, yeah, sure, I, I have a lot of number of projects that we're producing and that I'm hoping to affect people and say something to people and stuff like that. And I start to show back up on the 9th of November. But that's, you know, that's going to be new for me. It's, it's also going into the show during the time of COVID where there's all these new protocols and things in place and some just apprehensive, not knowing how, that's, how that'll feel and just positive that people are all trying knowing that if people all like continue to believe and connect with each other that we'll come out of this on you know and we'll be all right but it's uh it's gonna be a process well i think that's my time with you thank you so much uh it's been such a pleasure talking with you and i'm very excited for people to get to see the film oh great it's great it's great to talk to you too <laughs>